ever talked to someone and then realized that they have cuts along their arms? Have you ever dealt with a family member whose actions reminded you of a child? What if that person is your daughter? Today's episode is about borderline personality disorder and on how to deal and more importantly, how to have hope. Hannah, you have had many patients with this disorder. Mm -hmm. What are they like and how do you know that someone has that disorder? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, good question. Well, this disorder started to really, you can say that the rate of this disorder came up from the early 2000s. You saw a lot of cutting behavior, a lot of self-harm. And um, well, first of all, a personality disorder is when you have maladaptive behavior and thoughts and feelings and to such a degree that it impairs the functioning of several areas of your life so in your relationships you can't keep a job and you yeah you have trouble with family members with yourself and when this this whole package that we call then a personality disorder and uh, someone who has a borderline personality disorder in america they would say it's a cluster it's a cluster b they what do you mean with cluster b yeah sorry they have so in in america they classify it differently than here in in uh, europe where we use icd-11 so they have a personality di- disorders of cluster a b or c okay. and uh, borderline is in this uh, impulsive uh, acting out uh, category of disorders so histrionic um, borderline emotionally unstable those are because you, you you don't really meet a person who just fits uh, who's this uh, this classical what do you call it uh, by the book right yeah. that they just check mm. every single you know you can have some of this and a bit of histrionic a bit of that's you emotionally unstable uh, so I like this better to this think it's a cluster okay and you yeah. have a little bit of everything inside of that cluster mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and one who has has a borderline has a problem with emotional regulation that's 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 the their big thing okay. so you you basically you meet an adult who will sometimes behave like a child have tantrums have these these crying sessions and you know can, in the middle of a of a train full of people just start screaming at you like to the red in the face these things that you really you can see in a toddler and that that's normal but in an adult it's it's way out there and mm-hmm. they have a lot of trouble with their own identity that they feel they have trouble knowing who they are and that really changes daily and uh, they have this black and white thinking, so they'll idealize you uh, for months, and then you do something that they don't like, that they'll sense that there's rejection, because they're mm-hmm. really, really sensitive to rejection, and and then you're a witch. Then you're the okay. worst person in the world. And this often happens to, to them when you're their therapist, because in the beginning, you're idolized, and then suddenly it turns if you... St- call off the appointment because you have an emergency then suddenly you're no good and you're just the worst therapist yeah there is like a trigger Uh and then it just shifts yeah because they're so sensitive to rejection and that comes from their childhood Mm -hmm. these are usually girls who who grew up with alcoholic parents Mm -hmm. or uh, were somehow neglected and many many of the cases they've um, experienced abuse sexual abuse Okay. It's mostly girls who have who have these disorders. Some some boys as well, but in boys it manifests more uh, antisocially when they when they've experienced these things. That they 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 develop different pathologies. So this is mainly girls, and, and they you as a therapist, <laughs> how do you realize that someone has this um, personality disorder? Is it just you start talking to them, and then at some point you realize ah. It might go into this direction, as you said, like it goes into this cluster, mm-hmm. as you yeah. said. Yeah, you. Well, the the ones that I've dealt with have usually had a lot of tattoos, a lot of you know different hairstyles. You know, they color it. A lot of face tattoos. It really they they because they're so vulnerable and so scared of being rejected, and they expect rejection. Okay. So they'll sort of dress up already uh, yeah like as that. you know f off i don't need you either mm-hmm. 
or I'm dangerous, don't come any closer because they are afraid of that closeness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they they live in this self-fulfilling prophecy because they expect people to to be well, bad people. And then in their interactions with them, they make them into bad people mm -hmm. because they cannot interact with others in the way that we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very high in neuroticism. So this is, yeah, some some would call it it has a, this. It's extreme neuroticism. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to ask you because I mean we've met people that had very difficult upbringings, right? That experienced trauma, but not all of them end up having such a disorder. Can yeah. someone deal with that a bit better? And that's what I wanted to ask you. What makes the difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very, very good question because we're, we don't come out as blank sheets. We all have different personality traits, tendencies towards different personality traits. And this is why two two siblings can grow up in the same home with the same parents and one can develop a borderline disorder, so disorder while the other one doesn't. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have. And um, Is it also true, sorry to interrupt, but is it also true that people with this disorder sometimes spend a lot of money? Or is that something else? Yeah, because it's an acting out disorder. It's mm -hmm. it, They're very impulsive. That, that's what I right. mean, right? And so they, if they have like this positive emotions and they can get out and just spend all the money without yeah. thinking. And they also have a, a lot of dangerous sexual behaviors that mm -hmm. they'll go out in the, in, in a, when they're triggered mm -hmm. and they'll they get into bad relationships with bad people and they also, they attract those sort of people yeah and so they when they get into trouble it's of the sexual nature the mm. yeah that they do spend money that isn't theirs and um then we're um, back to the self um right so because of because of this uh, when you're neurotic you're very volatile in yeah. your emotions so mm -hmm. you at the small at the hair trigger you just you feel extreme you know pain or sadness mm -hmm. and these the borderliners they can't uh, deal with emotional pain right so that's that's when we get to the cutting mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. when the self-harm because mm -hmm. it is easier for them to tolerate physical pain yeah. than emotional pain okay and i had this it's crazy and i worked in a, in a psychiatric ward and they And uh, there was this girl who had this, who had just cut herself mm -hmm. severely. So I needed to to stitch it up. Oh no! Yeah, yeah, no. That, but that happens uh, a lot. That's uh, how I learned to suture. <laughs> it was borderline really? girls at uh, at in the psychiatric ward. Oh, this is ward. terrible. No. Yeah, and and uh, they have this crazy pain tolerance, the, the threshold that I definitely don't have. Yeah, and uh, and she just refused. For, for me to put a, a lidocaine a shot she just she wanted to suture just like that and she went through it as well it was okay I couldn't force her and we went several rounds I tried yeah. to convince her that this was a good idea because it was going to be painful she just uh, had a very different yeah. way of dealing with, with physical pain, pain. Oh, yeah wow. friend who who has this her sister is probably she's not officially diagnosed but we assume that she has that she has these these issues and she lives with their mom she's at the end of her 20s and she's we've talked a lot about this my friend and I because she needs help and how to deal with it it's very difficult for family members I've also had a lot of a lot of moms a lot of people who have this in the family and they need therapy to, because it's that difficult to deal with that they have psychiatric symptoms from dealing with this in the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so she said that I could use this as an example. So her sister is at the end of her 20s, lives with a mom. The other day they had a an argument about money, so about yeah. inheritance, about having, getting help from the mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this argument, which was for my friend and her mom, a very logical one, and they were just, just discussing who gets what. Mm -hmm. And she triggered and she left. And then no idea where she was. She just disappeared. Just she disappeared. Just and they didn't they don't know her friends. They don't know where she would have gone oh, to. Wow. And uh, yeah, with their word sick, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then it's a question how to deal with mm -hmm. the thing like that. And it's uh, it's not uh, uncommon. They they run away from home, you know, they feel rejected, and then they reject you. Yeah. And they were going. Uh, what did I say? And, you know, what did she say? And really trying to 
to make it reasonable because mm -hmm. they're they're reasonable people and they were thinking through it with logic and then I sort of said no this is this is purely emotional mm -hmm. and you have to um this is where you have to set boundaries yeah and and show okay this you're welcome here we yeah. want you mm -hmm. but when you behave like a child we won't go and search for you we're it's a very difficult thing to do because they're scared. Mm -hmm. But because of this childish behavior, you're also fooled that this is this isn't an adult you're dealing with. Yeah. So you yeah. have to have faith that it is it is an adult mm -hmm. and she will be able to take care of herself. Mm -hmm. If so you need you need certain I don't know, kind of trust is maybe the wrong word, mm -hmm. but it's like as you said, you need to have faith that even though this personality disorder is there still an adult you're not dealing with a toddler right so at some point they should be um um how do you say that selbstständig they should be yeah. able to take care of themselves at some point right yeah, have some sort of uh, autonomy yeah. yeah 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 which is i mean she'll probably get into dangerous situations and has done in the past mm -hmm. because because they do they they're with the wrong people uh, as you said they're impulsive yeah and especially when they've been triggered and they're in emotional pain they they do hurt themselves mm -hmm. but they rarely um act on their suicidal um suicidal ideation why not they have a lot it's, of it's suicide <laughs> yeah it's you know they they can hurt themselves hurt themselves badly yeah um but they also have a lot of anxieties okay. so in my experience they that anxiety will keep them from doing the the fatal acts, mm -hmm. but they they will land themselves in the hospital from taking taking too many pills or but then it's 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 usually then s those drugs that won't be fatal like benzodiazepines where you'll you'll pass out you'll become uh, unconscious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than that it'll, it's fatal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or like these antihistamines that'll that is really make you drowsy mm -hmm. and it's dangerous in very large doses but then mm -hmm. so these so these things no so i so this is a, should they go and search for her and bring her back yeah and then that's then she's won that interaction mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. then so that that is very where it's very very uh, difficult to know where can I set the boundary? Is it dangerous to set the boundary? Can you even set the boundaries as a mother? Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like when because when when your daughter runs away, you think she might be in danger. Is mm. there? Do you really come to a point where you say no? She's done that a hundred times. I know she will come back. Mm -hmm. As or is there always this fear? What if it's this time different? And then you search for her anyways. You give in, right? Yeah, that's what that that's what many do, and that's why I had had a Is mother and yeah in therapy, where I guided through this for months, and uh, in the end, she she said she couldn't come to therapy anymore because I told her, you know, that you should sit. This was before I became a mother, mm -hmm. and I really didn't understand then how strong that bond is, and and she also felt so guilty that mm -hmm. that her daughter had become this way that from being raised in that home mm -hmm. um that that also kept her from really putting the foot down when she when she should have mm -hmm. and um and she also didn't want those months of not having any contact which was then the result always of her setting a boundary saying no I'm not going to give you more money now yeah because that was what she, the daughter came back when she wanted money yeah yeah and then uh, her new husband then said, no, we can't give any more money and don't and try to tell her to set these boundaries. Yes. And she, she just couldn't. She, her, her mom heart just bled yeah. too much. And yeah. uh, she just gave in and gave in. And so they were they always went these rounds with that with that daughter. And I kept saying, you know, you have to cut ties. You have to say you can't live that way. You're depressed yourself. And yeah, But she said she couldn't come to therapy with me anymore because... Yeah. I was recommending these things that was just not possible for her to do. Mm -hmm. But still, I think I do have, a, I, I can empathize with, with her that she um, couldn't do that. However, I think at some point, I think when you are, even if, if it, yeah, maybe it's, it's different when it's your child, but with such toxic behavior, sometimes you you need to distance yourself, right? And as you said, cut ties and protect yourself, actually. Mm hmm at yeah. some point, I think it is necessary. If it's your, I mean, maybe that's then then something else. But um, you said you gave that advice before you became a mother, and you said it certainly changed your view 
yeah. as soon as you became one. Yeah, because now I'm thinking I mean, if Eliana did something horrible and landed herself in prison, I would just uh, show up there every day <laughs> and make her food and sit yeah, there with her. her like was, yeah, they would. They'd, of course, there's yeah. nothing that she could do that would make. Uh, of course, I would suffer. Uh, but if, you know, if I could just have contact with her, and but yeah, so I, I wrote this article about family estrangement where I criticized therapists for recommending that kids cut ties to their parents because that's something you see a lot now. Is something like seventy percent of students that uh, they did this at Cambridge, the survey, and they all were just saying that no, they didn't have any contact with their parents, mm-hmm. and I just recognized that from my own therapy room from before I was a mother mm-hmm. and uh, so I wrote this article and then I had a lot of uh, feedback on yeah but some like you're saying now some ties some ties are toxic when do you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and uh, I think this are you developing yourself psychiatric symptoms that's one of these signs that is really not good for you and maybe just the 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 child parent example is a bad one yeah, because it's just from nature's side, we just we're, we're unable to. It's like almost yeah. impossible. Like I try to tell my friend that she has to just she has to live her life and be happy, because that's also the thing. Her sister is very jealous of her, and it's difficult for her to see that her sister has everything that she would like to have that she's not able to create for herself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That she has to keep her sister in her life because she wants to obviously yeah. they love each other mm-hmm. uh, without being consumed by the bond without changing mm-hmm. the way she lives her life mm-hmm. and just be be there uh, welcoming mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you they, i want contact with you when when you're ready when you're in your your good phase right because it goes up and down mm-hmm. then you're, you're welcome but mm-hmm. i'm not gonna come running after you I'm going to have faith that you can take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, one thing we haven't touched, I think, is with the, this disorder, they can also be very manipulative, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's now we, we were talking about the emotional control and everything. And with um, when I understood you correctly, when you're high neuroticism, it's even more difficult for you to, to control that. So, so there is a slight, there are high chance that you end up in such a personality disorder. But like the how they manipulate their also loved ones. Mm-hmm. I think that is one thing yeah. we haven't touched so much yet. Right, yeah. Because they, they they know you. So they know exactly which buttons to push. And they, when you develop a personality disorder like that, mm-hmm. you have coping strategies. So you instrumentalize people's feelings to get them to do what you want, what you mm-hmm. need them to do. And the ones who have borderline disorder, they're very good at playing at your empathy. Ooh. So you have these tantrums and these yeah. fits of just crying and, and they're, they can exude this, this hopelessness and this that you want um, attending a supervisor of mine he said once that you know when you've had a, someone with the borderline in your in your room when they leave you feel drained you feel okay. empty because they yeah. sort of they they Suck take that from you yeah mm-hmm. because of their own hopelessness and they're just trying to mm-hmm. deal with that as best as they can and then if you're not careful if you don't protect yourself mm-hmm. Then you just, you end up feeling drained. And I had so many, so many of these patients that he told me that in the end, you're only allowed to have two per day. Because I would just, I would come home and I wouldn't be able to deal. I mean, we're taught to uh, control ourselves in the way that it's, that it, that we're not touched. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I mean, we're human beings and we, we do this because we have empathy, because it's coming from a place of compassion mm-hmm. that I think uh, that was just bound to happen. So it, it got better when I caught down. Yeah. But um, he also taught me that um, I should I should look to how I'm feeling. So that's how you can know. Okay. If you're that, being that manipulated. That would have been my next question. Sorry. Yeah. 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 That yeah. you, instead of looking at what did they say and what did you say and what mm-hmm. went on in the conversation, mm-hmm. rather investigate how you're feeling at that moment when they're crying, crying, crying in front of you or mm-hmm. you're they're having these tantrums. How do you really feel? Because when someone who doesn't have this uh, when they're when they're telling you a story that's something's going on with them and they start crying mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's out of character yeah then you feel true empathy you really you're moved to action on their behalf because yeah they touch they touch on that in you but mm-hmm. when you're when you're witnessing one of these one of these tantrums or one of these crying fits you're feeling more forced 
then you you can you can you can notice the slight difference if okay. you're if you're exposed to it enough times. Yeah. That yeah. you're there's something and it's not completely right. You just want it to stop. You just want to get out mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. It's not true empathy because it's being displayed. It's not it's coming from a place of them wanting you to do something. Okay. Yeah. Not because of their mm -hmm. actual pain. Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to explain. I think I think it does make sense. What what is a bit hard for me, I mean, I've met also people who um now that that sounds a bit mean, but I think who I also enjoy to suffer. You know, when mm -hmm. you have someone complaining about the problem or maybe mm -hmm. maybe it is huge, but it doesn't matter what you tell them or what you say to them. They will always come back. No, it's it's actually worse. You don't understand, right? Mm. So they and um, they will. They don't really want the help sometimes. And then I come also to a point sometimes where I'm a fed up. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know what? <laughs> Pull yourself together. <laughs> like that's it. Or the the second one is that I also feel like kind of sad, and I I take it on. Um, I had once a, a friend who went through really bad times. And of course, those couple of months were also difficult for me because I basically went through it with her together. And I mm -hmm. didn't set myself those boundaries because I thought maybe it's a bit selfish, but I thought she needs me. To were you able go. to help her? Or how did it go um, in the end? Yeah, she, she felt better, but she, she also was in therapy. So I, I also forced her to increase uh, the number of therapy sessions she has. <laughs> yes, you're looking at me like, oh my God, Ellie, what did you do? <laughs> no, that was probably, but, probably wise. No, but I thought I'm not a professional. No, no. I'm, I can be your friend, but I cannot be a therapist. And if but it shows how you felt helpless, how all of completely. your suggestions, everything just didn't work. Completely. Wasn't... Yeah. So that was, that was difficult. She's much better now. Is it because I was there as a friend? I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I, now, now thinking back, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about your quote, like the, the feelings are temporary, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. also there, it took a long time, but at some point she, um, yeah. she managed and right. got over it. Yeah, and that's yeah. what you have to do with these, with these girls, right? You really have to, they're terrified, terrified of, of, of their feelings because they're so intense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they haven't had that proper emotional regulation modeled by their parents. Mm -hmm. so this is the problem when you grow up with parents who are drunk on the couch, they're not available to you or you've been objected to abuse or you've been neglected or like this girl that I was talking about that, you know, the father had left when, mm -hmm. when they were, they were kids. So that was it's one of the biggest rejections that you can have early mm -hmm. on in your life that a parent leaves you a parent is the one person in the world who's supposed to love you unconditionally yeah and forever yeah, yeah. so that's really that's very damaging when mm -hmm. a parent leaves yeah what do you do when this friend then starts threatening that she will hurt herself Yeah, this that also happens a lot, right? The threat, I'm going to do something. Mm -hmm. Because they do have suicidal thoughts that, yeah, if you respond to it, that's just going to happen then again and again. Okay. And they are in charge of their own their own behavior. They're, mm -hmm. They have their own responsibility. You just have to keep reminding yourself of that, that you cannot take that away from them. Mm -hmm. They will do what, what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And in no case is that then on you. Yeah. I think it's what what's very important in this is this modeling of emotional regulation that they don't mm -hmm. that they haven't had that. Uh, Can they done. learn that? Can you right. be and this healed? Is, this is what this is what we then try to do in therapy. There's a special kind of cognitive behavioral therapy called dialectical behavioral therapy. It does have some evidence that it works with borderline personality disorder, and that's basically when then the therapist goes in as the parent to model emotional regulation where that hasn't been done properly mm -hmm. so and I, i did this with a couple of them and it uh, i mean it, it worked for a time where then they're when they're in a difficult situation difficult moment instead of where you would normally then sort of save that episode and talk about it next week in therapy mm -hmm. they would call me then immediately oh. when that when they were in trouble and yeah, say yeah, this and this and this happened and then my friend said this and that and then you know now i'm sitting here with with pills in my hand and i want to take them Did you and always then, pick up your phone? Yeah, so because I was doing this therapy with them, yeah. I always had 
I, they were always allowed to call me or text me or send a message even if it was really? late in the evening yeah and then then it would be problems if I didn't pick up or if you know I, if I had another crisis to deal with then they would feel rejected and we had to go 10 rounds about that and then there would be a lot of resistance if they would test me as a yeah. therapist they would test if I was really there for them so you, you mean mm -hmm. other patients or also the hospital also no the, the, the patients, patients would test me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 That mm -hmm. to see, are you know, do I really matter to you? Are you really there for me? So it was a problem that I went, what I, I went sorry, on honeymoon. I, now, now I'm getting off track, but but this is really interesting to me. What if you don't like a patient? Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Is never that... happened. <laughs> <laughs> this never happened before. no but you no. know what i mean because yeah. when you say you're always available for them mm -hmm. you have to be a good therapist i, I know that you, you this is your job but sometimes come on you have your private life you have yeah. your family and then you have this idiot calling you <laughs> on a friday evening. you know what i mean yeah maybe, maybe this is a bad question maybe just, just scratch that. no I, I'm, I'm, i'm thinking but i never had that but you know they're very charming they're usually very extroverted oh. they they you know, they're good at making you like them. Mm. So maybe that's why I have had patients where I was like, mm, okay, just, you know, <laughs> bring out your... Of course that happens. Yeah. But not that it was a problem. I will always had these talks with myself, okay, then I'd find something that I found interesting with them. Mm -hmm. But that was a conscious effort that I had to do. Mm -hmm. was, okay, find something that you think is interesting and then talk about that. Mm -hmm. And that that really helped, but then with these girls, that never happened. Okay, but if it's a that's my problem with this kind of therapy, right? The dialectical behavioral therapy, where you're always there, and they get addicted to it. Yeah, it's and they're terrified that you some that someday you're not going to be there for them. They know that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. went on honeymoon for two weeks. That was then the first, the only time where I where I turned off that phone. And when I came back, they were. Mm -hmm. Two of them were in hospital. No. Yeah, of course. It was very difficult. Then, you know, even I had substitutes, I had oh everything God. planned. We had yeah. like your, in uh, Germany, you say, Notfallskoffer. Yeah. Like your day, so your little For emergency case. rucksack that you yeah. you have your meds and you know if you have your crisis then you have all these tools oh, you get, that you, you can to the patient no we have this sort of imaginary emergency okay. suitcase for when they're uh -huh. have an emotional crisis i didn't want they, to smile <laughs> but yes you're yes. yeah but i feel okay it doesn't really mm -hmm. it's It's good in the moment. It does help them where they have their mindfulness and their medication and the number of the emergency yeah. room and the, like this you go the friend I can call when yeah. I'm in trouble. It, yeah. it, different it helps scenarios. Them. Different just scenarios that you have the mm -hmm. solution there. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter. Just the knowledge that I wasn't then available, yeah. that was enough to just... Oh, that God. did not go well. So that's when I thought, is this therapy really... Is there an it? alternative? Uh, Or is yeah, that... actually, actually, I, what I found that what is a stabilizing factor um, is if they find a partner that is low in neuroticism, just oh. stability itself. That happened to one of them yeah. where he just sort of he leveled. Mm -hmm. every, he, he had a very good stabilizing influence. Mm -hmm. and uh, she was sure of him and that. So my supervisor also said that they found good uh, pregnancy. As a stabilizing factor, really? So, yeah, and I also I was also surprised. About That's not that. the scenario when I'm thinking when I think of my friends who were <laughs> <laughs> pregnancy. Yeah. It, wow. <laughs> no, but they say there's mm -hmm. something with your, your body just sort of it interesting takes care of that. Interesting. Well, anyway, that okay. That wasn't something but, I but saw. That not, was something. Wait, 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 wait. I need to to take a break here. We cannot recommend on this podcast. People who are facing challenges to get pregnant. This is not the advice we want to give. No, 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 no. no. Just This I is... wanted to make that clear. Well done, Evelyn. Well done. <laughs> okay. One other thing. Talked about this disorder, right? This really, really disease. But I think what everyone can relate is having super negative thoughts. You think about, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, you have this thought. You have self-doubt. I just want to make it a bit more practical for people who get into mm -hmm. the spiral and do not know how to get out. So is there any way for everyone to deal with such emotions in a better way? Yeah. And that's what we do in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, we go through this, you, let's say you're high in neuroticism and mm -hmm. you're very quick to feel negative emotions like this. 
that I'm not good enough, these negative thoughts about yourself, uh, or I'm stupid, ah, there again, I'm stupid, I said something, I'm always stupid, these um, thoughts, uh, schematas that one has, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we women are, as we said, half a standard deviation higher in neuroticism than, than men, so we have this more often. So more the tendency to, to be like that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So and so then we would investigate what triggers it, mm -hmm. which thoughts uh, does does it trigger, and then then which feelings and which behavior does that again lead to, and then we try to together break out of that circle and we look at the I'm not good enough, for example, what caused that, and look at a situation. Is there any alternative way of thinking that could make that that's believable? That could make this feeling I'm not good enough maybe more differentiated. Maybe they say, okay, usually I'm good enough, but in this situation I could have done better. Or okay. this exact thing was not as good as I would have liked it to be, mm -hmm. but usually I'm good enough. Okay. Right? That it's more differentiated, that you don't have a blanket label, I'm just, I'm not, I'm stupid. Or you say, okay, I should have prepared more for this meeting, but I'm a smart person. Okay. That you, and as a parent, yes. you can yes. do that. And I think parents do this naturally with their kids. Mm -hmm. and they also know them, so they know what to say. So they can point to, because when you're in that mode, I'm, like, I'm just so stupid, I always do this, I always do this. Then you also forget the, the, good, things. the good things or yeah. all the situations that came before where you didn't do that, where you weren't stupid, where you did get an A. And then as a parent, you pull those things up and you say, no, look. You know, you, when you worked really hard on this before, mm -hmm. you got an A. Or hey, don't you remember that you won two tournaments before this? And you say, so, okay, yeah, maybe. So and, and parents will do this with, and that's, that's CBT. Okay, so basically it's not say them, do not think this thought, mm -hmm. right? Not make them stop thinking that, but give them kind of an alternative way of approaching it. And, yeah. and try to see also positive things that happened in the past, for right. example, that helps you mm -hmm. to accept that maybe, yeah, this was an F up. Yeah. Um, but in general, like I'm not the worst person on earth. Exactly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then also try to behave in a way that will, so that you see, okay, when I behave in this way, so this trigger makes me pull into myself and become very introverted and I don't talk. And then when I don't talk, then people move away from me, for example. Then I, when I just sit here by myself, then I, yeah, obviously they're not going to speak to me. And then that's because of that behavior, not because my hair doesn't look shiny enough today. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That you, that that certain triggers and thoughts that, oh, how do I look? And okay, oh, no, it's because I'm sweating. It's because I'm sweating. You know, start thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And that behavior is then what leads to then further triggers from your surroundings. Yeah. Yeah. So really try to break it up and see, ah, it's, if I change that behavior, then it will lead to fewer triggers from my surroundings. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you usually draw this circle yeah. that you have a trigger a thought, behavior, or trigger, feeling, thought, behavior, behavior. Mm -hmm. and then that behavior leads to a new trigger and then you in this endless spiral of bad thoughts, bad behavior, mm -hmm. bad thoughts, bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to go in and say, okay, is there a believable way of thinking in an alternative way that could lead to different behavior? I, I still think the keyword is believable. Yeah. Because if you start, yeah, no, but if you, if you, start thinking you try to to take uh, positive things and they are just not believable i guess you will end up going back to the negative thoughts again yeah it will if not it, help you right don't, exactly mm -hmm. so that's why this conversation with a friend where she just keeps saying no you're amazing you're amazing you look great this is not gonna help you feel any better yeah yeah but mm -hmm. and the other thing i would do with uh with my kid if she's high in neuroticism is to practice with her to pull up positive thoughts to pull up things that she looks forward to mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that you feel hopeful okay and not just like oh don't think about that don't think about that it mm -hmm. doesn't work yeah. you're great it doesn't work yeah but to so, okay, you know i feel really sad right now by tomorrow i'm gonna do this and that you know, just two weeks to to summer vacation and then you have so much to look forward to that you you know you're feeling sad it's gonna go away mm -hmm. it's just a feeling tomorrow you'll probably feel differently yeah temporary right, right? yeah so if you're very temporary. quick to feel negative emotions mm -hmm. trying to sort of 
learn to pull up something you're looking forward to. Yeah. It's a great skill. So with that, I think you already gave a brilliant answer to our usual question, what should I tell my daughter? So I will take that yeah. as an answer. However, I kind of ended the topic about the um, borderline personality disorder. When you realize that your kid, your daughter, the tendency to go into that direction, what do you recommend a parent? I'm thinking that's mm-hmm. that's my I mean God, I guess it's difficult. difficult I think for for me as a non professional mm-hmm. um psychiatrist like for me uh, probably it would be bring it to a professional, mm-hmm. get some help, get some professional help because I think as a parent at some point you probably face your limits. Right. I could I could imagine. Yeah, although I'm not so I I would be very scared that the therapist would uh, recommend cutting all ties all together mm-hmm. and try to go in there as a substitute for the parent. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that I would re- recommend her do that. I would just try to be there when when the good behavior shows mm-hmm. that this relationship is open and then try as best as I could to not engage with the impulsive negative behavior. Just really try as best as I could mm-hmm. to just say, you know, I'm going to go about my life Mm-hmm. and I'm here for you when you need me you have a place to stay I'm going to help you as best as I can with finding a job and all these things like that you would do for your child mm-hmm. but if you run away from home or if you if you disappear if you're just going to have faith that you'll come back because you know that I'm always here mm-hmm. that's what I would recommend just try to that you you are that stable place very good You know what it's coming next. So, a friend of mine Mm. has watched this TV series about Elizabeth Holmes. Oh, I also Uh, watched that. Really good. Really good. I I loved it too. Um, The former CEO of Theranos. Is now in jail? (laughs) Isn't she? (laughs) Yes. Maybe her mom visits her. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) The question that I have for you is, it has been reported that she started to deepen her voice to actually sound more professional so that people take her more seriously, more convincing. Um, So she changed her behavior. So Mm -hmm. my question Mm -hmm. to you is, Is it a thing? Is it really true if we have deeper voices that we appear more assertive? Right. For men, yes. There's several studies that show that men with deeper voices have better luck with women, getting women. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And it's really men's voices are, the difference is something like 60%. Like it's a real, it's it's a, it's it a big odd. difference. If you have someone with a very high voice, man, it, it can be a bit odd. It, right? Yes, but yes. they think, anthropologists think that this has, this big difference is because of uh, sex selection. That oh. we really prefer men with deeper voices because it uh, it shows power. Oh, we like you know we choose taller men we choose better men who are who earn more than us who are yeah. better educated and i think that falls in line with that that we Poor just them. it's <laughs> yeah it is uh, it it shows yeah. power mm-hmm. so i think they think that we've sexually selected men who have deeper voices so that the difference is now so big okay that they've they've but i'm, I'm not sure that that is the that, that applies to females yeah because okay. because that would just it just seems very pathological mm-hmm. but maybe maybe you see more certain of yourself if you have a deeper voice i mean i read because when i started in uh, at the hospital after mm-hmm. i graduated and i was uh, i'm very short i'm 160 it says my passport but really i'm 159 now <laughs> it's out there yeah, you said and it. i was 25 and i was like Jesus, how, how am i going to get how are you going to take me seriously yeah and i would uh, have to tell all these orderlies which are in a psychiatric cute psychiatric ward they're these huge guys mm-hmm. men who've worked there for years i'm going to tell them what to do they're not going to listen to me so i read this book about how to be taken seriously and that was in there deep in your voice oh, really? but also but you have stand, a beautiful voice just saying thank you. Yeah. stand further away and then speak yes. louder in a yes. deeper voice. So yeah. they said, <laughs> so I'm I was sure just, to stand further away, yeah. we're perfectly fine. Like, I would always take <laughs> several steps away and <laughs> scream at them. 
I'm just imagining. It didn't go very well. It didn't go it very didn't. well. That wasn't, I wasn't my best self. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was brilliant. Thank you so much for this. Oh, See I, you next time. Yeah, guys, I think that was it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Talk to you next time. <laughs>